Michael Nagler is Professor Emeritus of Classics and Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley, where he founded the Peace and Conflict Studies program and taught the Upper Division Nonviolence course, as well as meditation and other courses for over 20 years. He is founder president of the Berkeley-based Meta Center for Nonviolence, which can be found at www.metacenter.org, and the author of The Search for a Nonviolent Future, which received a 2002 American Book Award and has been translated into Italian, Korean, Arabic, and other languages. He has also written Our Spiritual Crisis, Recovering Human Wisdom in a Time of Violence, from 2005. The Upanishads with Sri Eknath Iswaran, 1987, and other books, as well as many articles on spirituality and peace, including numerous blogs for Yes Magazine, Truthout, and other sites. He has consulted for the U.S. Institute of Peace and many peace movement organizations and individuals, and the webcast of his, his year-long course on nonviolence, now available at the Meta Center's website, has received well over 100,000 visits. He is especially interested in what is now called unarmed civilian peacekeeping and served on the interim steering committee of the Nonviolent Peace Force. Among other awards, he received the Jamnalal Bajaj International Award for promoting Gandhian values outside India in 2007. Michael is a student of Sri Eknath Iswaran, founder of the Blue Mountain Center of Meditation which can be found at www.iswaran.org. He has lived at the center's ashram in Marin County since 1970 and is a presenter for the center's eight-point program. With that, it is now my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Michael Nagler. Thank you very much, Jake, and <clears throat> greetings, everyone. I thought we might start with just a little visual sense of who it is speaking to you this morning. Here is a... Uh, recent photograph of me uh, taken during the free speech movement when I was picking up uh, students who had just been returned from Santa Rita prison. I guess this picture shows that I do have a bit of an activist background and at one time also had a full head of hair. Uh, I'd like to move on now to, <clears throat> let's see, okay. There, there we are, a more recent picture, and this is the topic of our talk, Nonviolence, the State of Our Most Important Art. I was reminded of a quip that Mahatma Gandhi made one time. An Indian follower asked him, do you really think that nonviolence is the best way for India? They were asking him that all the time. And he said, no, I don't think nonviolence is the best way. I think it's the only way. And I'm convinced that that is true also. <clears throat> and I'd like to share with you everything that I know in the next 35 minutes and end with a rather uh, challenging and ambitious proposal about where we might go from here. Uh, just a reminder that I'm speaking to you from the Meta Center for Nonviolence uh, in Berkeley, California, where it's uh, cool and foggy. So good. So the first question is, what are we looking for? I pose this question because sometimes people, in attempting to understand or define nonviolence, uh, go barking up some kind of wrong tree. They might think that it's uh, a moral prescription that comes from some kind of religious tradition and it only applies to individuals who are part of that tradition. And there are other misconceptions that one runs across. The term nonviolence, uh, in its hyphenated form, I'll talk about that in a second, seems to have been first used by Gandhi in English in 1921, or perhaps even 1920, as Stephanie reminds me here at the center, in an attempt to translate uh, from uh, Gujarati, the Sanskrit original ahimsa, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, sort of around 1926, it starts being used in the West. Um, but the question for us is, how shall we define it? And I think I'd like to take a key quote each from Gandhi and from King, in reverse order, to point us in the right direction. So in 59, <clears throat> after receiving the Nobel Prize and returning from India, where he said he had gone on pilgrimage, Martin Luther King said every other country in the world he went as a tourist, but India he went as a pilgrim. He said this, 
Since being in India, I am more convinced than ever before that the method of nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. In a real sense, Mahatma Gandhi embodied in his life certain universal principles that are inherent in the moral structure of the universe, and these principles are as inescapable as the law of gravitation. I put a few of those phrases into italics because I think they're key focusers for us. Uh, we are dealing here with what he calls something inherent in the structure of the universe. He calls it the moral structure of the universe, as inescapable as the law of gravitation. And uh, Gandhi also would refer to nonviolence as a law. <clears throat> he said it was a living law as opposed to uh, just a physical law, but it was a law. And at one point he was asked, uh, why were you only partly successful in your campaign? He said the success of our campaign was mathematically proportionate to the purity of our efforts. I'm not going to be using the word purity, but it's just as we can apply certain standards of prediction and control in physical science, they are working in some funny way in the laws of violence and nonviolence also. But on one occasion, Gandhi said it even more simply when he said, it's not nonviolence until you love your enemies. This, this helps us to understand that nonviolence begins with an internal transformation. And let's move on and see if I can say a little bit more about that. Etymologically, the word he was translating, ahimsa, and this will be familiar to many of you if you've had the inestimable pleasure of reading my book, um, is a very interesting word, which is apparently a desiderative that we linguists call uh, this kind of formation a desiderative because it in indicates not so much the thing or the action, but the desire to perform the action. And that's useful because ahimsa would then translate into the lack of desire to harm. And when you add into that the fact that these negative prefixes in Sanskrit often were uh, an indirect way of indicating something intensely positive, uh, you'll be pointed to a definition that I'm going to share with you in a minute. And satyagraha, it's pronounced that way because the second day is long. <clears throat> Satyagraha literally means graha, hold from the root gr. Cognate with English grab means grasping truth to oneself. That's the image that comes up in that word. When we translate it as soul forth, truth forth, uh, all those translations are useful, but ultimately it means clinging to truth for all your worth. Uh, before we get quite to my definition, I'd like to share with you briefly Kenneth Boulding's uh, seminal work on the three faces of power, where he explained that there are three ways of getting things done in the human world. Threat power, which is covered pretty well by political science, where you approach someone with the attitude, do what I want or I'll do something you don't want, which is what our entire military system and prison system are based on. A little bit less abusive is exchange power, which is covered by economics. <coughs> Excuse me, don't have a cough button out here. <clears throat> In exchange power, you say, give me something I want and I'll give you something you want. And they all, you know, I'll give you 290 and you give me a latte. That's about how it works out here in California, Marin County. But there's a third kind of power which is far more potent and is studied by almost no one except this bud budding field of peace science. And he calls it integrative power. And the attitude there is, I will be authentic and we will draw closer. Integrative power draws its power from the fact that innately human beings want, they seek unity with one another. This is a fact that science is now zeroing in on. I'm going to get back to that <clears throat> in about 15 minutes. <clears throat> but it's a fact of our nature that we don't like alienation <clears throat> from our fellows. 
however much we actually are conditioned to seek it by the mass media. So in integrative power, you cut through all of that conditioning and you touch upon the innate desire for unity with the other person. I'll just give you one very stark example of how this works. In 1992, there were terrible communal riots in the state of Gujarat, Gandhi's home state. These mobs came storming into the, a village in Gujarat looking for Muslims to kill them. They were quite enraged. <clears throat> a woman <clears throat> stood in front of her hut <clears throat> who was hiding her Muslim neighbor in the hut. <clears throat> excuse me. The mob said, excuse me one second. The mob said, we think you're hiding a Muslim in there. I recently tried this question on a bunch of high school students that we had here at the Meta Center. I said, what would you say? And to a person, they all said, I would lie. I would say, who, me? No, I'm not hiding anybody, which is probably what I would do also under the circumstances. But this woman said, yes, I am. And the mob was uh, startled. And they said, uh, well, we want him out of there. And she then said, first kill me, and then you may enter. At which point, the mob was so nonplussed that they turned around and went away. And Nirmala Deshpande, who told me the story, said that it was not just this one woman, but through some kind of uh, feat of self-organization, hut after hut, village after village, hundreds of Muslims were saved by intrepid women who did something like that. And how did it work? It worked by them saying, I will be authentic. You're telling me that my neighbor is an object and you want to kill him, and I'm standing up for the truth. Uh, he is a person. And uh, sure enough, an enormous amount of alienation is overcome by that act. And so I will sometimes use the term integrative power. But my working definition of nonviolence is <clears throat> I'm using now an image from Michael True's book, uh, Force Field More Powerful Than War. A force field generated by the conversion of a negative drive. By negative drive, I mean that you can imagine the amount of fear that was generated in that woman, the amount of fear or anger that we may feel in a conflict situation when we decide not to act on it, it in the right circumstances, it will roll over into some kind of positive force, and that positive force is nonviolence. As for satyagraha, it is the impl implementation of nonviolent energy or integrative power in the field of action. People still use these terms kind of interchangeably and in different ways also because the field is so new, but this is pretty much how I'll be using it. There's another try at this, um, which is a bit lengthier, that I say that nonviolence is a powerful method for harmonizing relationships with people and other forms of life for the establishment of justice and the ultimate well-being of all parties. It draws its power from awareness of the profound truth to which the wisdom traditions of all cultures, modern science, and common experience bear witness that all life is an interconnected whole. Ultimately, it is one. A couple more words on definitions. Usually today, people use the hyphenated form that Gandhi always used when they're just talking about the absence of violence, and they usually just mean they're the absence of physical violence. Without a hyphen, it tends more likely to mean the presence of a positive force, as we've been saying. Oftentimes, people ask me why we are stuck with this negative term, and I have to spend so much time digging out from under that word to get on with our discussion. Isn't there a better word? Frankly, I have not been able to find one in English or in any other language that I'm familiar with. In the People Power Uprising of 1986, in a language called Tagalog, they briefly were using a phrase which I thought was just beautiful, and I wish it had stuck, but it didn't. But the phrase is, Ale Dangal, to offer dignity. That's the most positive and the closest interpretation, translation that I know of in any language for what nonviolence really is. Okay, so now I'd like briefly to share with you, in my temptation is to Stop at this point and make sure you understood everything, but I, I'll have no way of knowing. So 
bear with me. I'd like to move on to give us a sense of the quantitative spread of nonviolence uh, since Gandhi and King. And this title, The Global Spread of Active Nonviolence, is the title of an article that was done by Richard Dietz and Walter Wink. Uh, they list off the number of countries where there has been a significant nonviolent episode. And just to share the conclusion with you, if we add all the countries touched by major nonviolent actions just since 1986, they were writing in about 2000, by the way, so then they list off some of them. And the other nonviolent struggles of our century, independence movements of India and Ghana, struggle against authoritarian governments and landowners in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico. This is good because it's giving us a sense of the different formats in which nonviolence can be implemented. Civil rights, united farm workers, women's movement, environmental, and so forth. The number of persons involved, that is, people who live close to the action or were uh, directly involved in it, reaches 3 billion, 300 million, 100,000 people, a staggering 61% of humanity. And as we all know, that has grown significantly since 2000, so that now more people than not, by far, have at least been close to some kind of nonviolent uprising. Um, this is a visual representation of part of that fact. Some people call this slide the world with measles, but it's really a study of where nonviolent episodes have occurred since Gandhi and King. By the way, I'm going to collect all of the references and make a slide out of them, uh, which you won't see today, but will be available in the published form of this slideshow. And here's another visual representation. I was attending a fellowship of reconciliation meeting in what was the formerly East Germany and walking out of a church. And I glanced over my shoulder and saw this chart and map, and I immediately knew what it must be. Weltkarte der Hoffnung, as it says up here, means the world map of hope. And it's Gewalt frei weltweit. Gewalt Freiheit, uh, oh, sorry, Gewalt Freiheit um, is a German word for nonviolence, which is rather a good one. It means freedom from violence worldwide. So every place that you see one of these little settle or fiche, as they would say in French, um, there was a major nonviolent uprising. And uh, I, have to, I have all of those, by the way, from those people. Well, this is just to give us a sense of the enormous diffusion of nonviolence throughout the globe following Gandhi's example, but we also have more sophisticated studies done right here at our host institution, the uh, International Center for Nonviolent Conflict by Stefan and Chenoweth. And again, just to quote you one concluding sentence, our findings show that major nonviolent campaigns have achieved success 53% of the time, compared with 26% for violent resistance campaigns. I, I cannot emphasize enough how useful this is, because people will come to you all the time and say it doesn't work. This is the main response that one gets. So if you come back at them with science um, very calmly, very persuasively, it's extremely helpful. So that was the quantitative side. Now let's look at the qualitative side, where things get even more interesting and more inspiring. What's new qualitatively since Gandhi and King? Mind you, I think Gandhi basically discovered all of it, but it's taken us, and is taking us, a long, long time to unpack all of those discoveries. For one thing, we've learned a lot more about paradigm shifts. We know more, though still not much about them. It would be enormously useful to continue because there's no question to change the world from its present to violent present to a nonviolent future is going to require a shift of that depth and that magnitude as what Thomas Kuhn in 1962 called a paradigm shift. 
Uh, we also know more, but still not much, about training, how to train for nonviolence, and uh, you can only imagine how important that is. Here's a nonviolence training that's going on at uh, Holy Land Trust in Bethlehem. And I'm happy to share with you, having spoken with Sami Awad yesterday, that tomorrow a hundred nonviolent, uh, sorry, a hundred, yeah, a hundred nonviolent leaders, a hundred Palestinian leaders are going to be receiving training at the uh, Holy Land Trust in uh, Bethlehem. There's a film out now called Little Town of Bethlehem that will give you a sense of what Sami is up to and happy to say that we're working closely with him at the Meta Center. So those are two things. We know how a little bit more about how paradigm shifts happen. We're starting to learn more about how to get training for, to make ourselves nonviolent. Almost more important than that, there's been an impressive growth in learning across nonviolent movements because the peace movement as a whole has been plagued from the get-go with discontinuity, so that every time something happens, which means every time there's enough of an atrocity to arouse the will of what Jonathan Shell calls the unconquerable world, the will of the people, everyone has to start from scratch. You have to reinvent the wheel. You have to remake all the mistakes that previous movements have made. And so there's really no forward motion as a whole. But uh, the ICNC, thanks to them once again, has spun off, for example, a group called uh, Canvas, which takes the best practices from the successful Utpor Rebellion in Serbia in 2000 and makes it available to people in similar situations. Um, when, <clears throat> when I was on the steering committee of the Nonviolent Peace Force, we insisted that the first thing that NP did was going to be a study of what we call unarmed civilian peacekeeping throughout the world. And so we have a very uh, capable, thorough study by Christina Schweitzer is on our uh, website at nonviolentpeaceforce.org. Which brings us to the a fourth qualitative change that within the field of nonviolent action, there are new institutions. And for me, as you've heard before, one of the most inspiring is unarmed civilian-based peacekeeping, used to be called third-party nonviolent intervention. And here's a picture of a nonviolent peace force, a fellow is wearing his logo, which is operating now in, I think, about four different places in the world, so that unarmed people committed to nonviolence, trained in it somewhat, actually go and interpose themselves and make themselves available in regions of really intense conflict. One of the reasons this uh, inspires me so much is if we want to get rid of the war system, we absolutely must have an alternative. We must have a way to <clears throat> defend ourselves without war, and this is a systematic way of doing that. <clears throat> Just give you a sense of how they operate and the different parts of the world. Uh, up here, I think you probably are seeing Mindanao. This is northern Uganda. This would be Sri Lanka, and uh, so forth. Here in Sri Lanka, incidentally, the Sarvodia movement has also adopted this old idea of Mahatma Gandhi's of the Shanti Sena, or a peace army, where you see these courageous women, determined women, not carrying arms, um, fueled by love. Uh, ready to impose themselves, interpose themselves where needed. Now, another huge development, and it's really quite recent, is that in the last 25 years, science, physical science as practiced in the West, has decided that you can learn more about nature by studying it when it works than you can by studying it when it breaks down. Uh, Sigmund Freud really started us off on a bad foot. Um, it wasn't his fault only, but there's a tremendous growth in what we call positive science. And I'm just going to mention three areas 
in which this has been very helpful for us, the three faces of positive science, if you will, complete revision of annual animal behavior from back in the days when you had these popularizers claiming that there's innate aggression dominated the world, nature. Studies of brain's activity during episodes of altruism. Uh, and finally, very recently, starting in 1988 in Italy, the discover of mirror neurons. Uh, I have a funny feeling that most of you listening to me are familiar with all of this stuff, but let me run through it very briefly. Here's an important study that was done by one of the biggest and best names in this field of animal behavior, Franz Dual. Tina, I hope I'm, Nina, I hope I'm present, uh, pronouncing that correctly, Dual. In 1996, he brought out a book called uh, uh, Good Natured, The Origins of Good and Evil in Humans and Other Animals. He told about an amazing experiment that they have performed which involved two different species of monkeys. Rhesus monkey, obviously I've chosen this picture with Erica's help uh, prejudicially to simplify matters, but the fact is that the rhesus monkey is a pretty aggressive critter. You would not want to meet one in a dark alley. So I'm calling this guy bad primate. We're going to have bad primate, good primate situation here. Uh, here's another Recent rhesus monkey really kind of struck home with me since I'm from New York. I, I can just hear this guy looking at me on the subway saying, you got some kind of problem with that. Now, uh, so he had a colony of these rhesus monkeys, uh, but he also had some stump tail monkeys. You know, this is our good primate. Uh, here's a picture of a typical stump, stump tail family. I hope you find this as uh, sentimental and heartwarming as I do, uh, stump tails, while they are a little bit larger than their rhesus cousins, they uh, apparently graduated from a Peace and Conflict Studies program somewhere. They're much more non-aggressive. Um, for one thing, when involved in an altercation, they will sometimes actually s stick a finger out to be bitten, and the aggressive part of your part party will bite hard on that finger, a stump tail will take the pain, and that will resolve the conflict. This is incidentally not a method that I'm recommending, I'm just pointing out. So Duval had a colony of stump tails and he tried the audacious experiment of putting them in with the rhesus monkeys to see whether the aggressive culture of the rhesus would prevail over the uh, nonviolent, or relatively nonviolent culture of the stump tails. So f at first they didn't know what to do at all. Then the rhesus monkeys would go up and be aggressive toward a stump tail. And to the aggressor's astonishment, the stump tail monkey would neither back down nor attack. Is this beginning to sound familiar? So after five months of this, the rhesus monkeys had completely calmed down. They had been won over. I'm not saying that they were meditating every morning, but at the very least, <laughs> they were they had shed their aggressive ways. Now comes the climax of the experiment. As if this were not good enough, Dual then took the stump tails out with the idea of mind of let's see how long it takes for the rhesus to revert to their violent ways. And lo and behold, uh, they just plain did not. So here are three features of nonviolent behavior that he's able to identify in primate uh, nature. One, the power of self-sacrifice. And let me pause here. I'm talking about the, the finger, the offering of the finger to be bitten. But let me point out just briefly that in studies of altruism where people are encouraged to do something mildly self-sacrificing for another party, even someone whom they don't know, the same brain centers light up as the ones that light up during episodes of intense uh, pleasurable experiences, like even drug experiences. So okay, so one thing is uh, the power of self-sacrifice. <clears throat> Another is 
what happens when you do not give in to the fight or flight impulse. And thirdly, most importantly perhaps for us, the fact that the peace culture is robust. It not only prevails over the war culture, but it prevails permanently. And mind you, we're talking, I don't know, about 250 million years back. <clears throat> okay, so moving on briefly now to mirror neurons, this discovery that if I see a person say, let's see, this is my brain. It's not very prepossessing, but you know, it's a classic, classicist's brain here, recovering classicist. So I see Stephanie reaching out for a cup of coffee. So these neuron centers light up. Well, guess what? The same action centers light up in my brain and send a signal to my muscle saying, go pick up your coffee. Then there's another set of neurons that comes in and says, wait a second, <clears throat> that's Stephanie, that's not you. And so I don't actually perform the action. But here's the conclusion of this remarkable work that's going on very intensely since uh, the 1980s. Any, when I'm, okay, let me put it this way. Let's say I'm in a conflict situation. I'm in a New York subway. Someone stands up and says, give me your wallet. Instead of firing back at him with the same frame of mind, anger and fear, I look him in the eye and say, look, I've got a little bit of money if that's what you want. Uh, otherwise, you know, how can I help you? I'm not scared of you. I'm not doing what you want, but I'm not going to fight you off either. That changes my brain. <clears throat> it changes the neurons that are firing off in my brain. That change is immediately transmitted to the brain of the other person. That doesn't mean it controls his or her behavior because <clears throat> there's still something known as free will. But it does mean that we now have a neurophysiological basis for what we have been saying in the field of nonviolence for years, that when I undergo a deep change in my attitude, that deep change is communicated to the people around me. So that gives us at least a substrate for what we call the nonviolence effect. So uh, with regrets, <clears throat> now let's move on to the most important part of what I wanted to share with you today, which is where do we go from here given all of these changes. And I propose that the entire world, nothing less than that, take up a major concerted effort that closely follows the Gandhian model and draws upon all the advantages discussed above, and we'll have, therefore, these features. <clears throat> it will have a goal within a goal. For Gandhi, Swaraj, the freedom of India, and even the end of colonialism was almost impossible. That's what we want. We want something that's not quite impossible, <laughs> almost impossible. But even that wasn't what he was after. He was, he was using India, and he admitted this very freely, <clears throat> he was using India as what he called an ocular demonstration that could lead eventually to the complete replacement of violence with nonviolence, otherwise known as the overthrow of Western civilization, which he had been after since 1909. I propose we use the same structure and we don't have to liberate ourselves uh, from foreign domination, but I think the, and I think we want to do something that the whole world can do together. And so as you can see, I propose that we tackle fixing climate change. It's nearly impossible, but not quite. And it would be done with an idea to creating a culture of nonviolence, exactly as Gandhi uh, proposed. He did the former as an ocular demonstration of the latter, I'm proposing we do this fixing climate change for the, to carry that a step further. <clears throat> oh, another feature is, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but nonviolence really has two wings. It has constructive program uh, where you, you carry out reforms in your own culture and it has what I call obstructive program or civil disobedience or satyagraha where you resist people who are trying to do an injustice. And if you look at most of the nonviolent campaigns since Gandhi and King, you will find that they've either been 
uh, civil disobedience, like the Akpur Rebellion, which uh, incidentally ICNC has, um, along with Zimmerman in York, turned out a magnificent documentary called Bringing Down a Dictator. Or they do constructive program the way the landless workers movement does in Brazil, but they have no idea what to do when they're attacked by police or whatever. What Gandhi was able to do was keep both of these things in balance and call on one when the other was not possible, and, and we need to be able to do that also. <clears throat> so I have to kind of move on here, but another feature would be that it draws on all that we've learned in the past, make full use of scientific advances, and above all, be aware that we are part of a much larger struggle. I'm not saying that everybody should drop what they're doing and work directly on climate change, but whatever they're doing, be aware how it fits into that larger struggle. Why do I choose climate change? There are four reasons. It's a universal problem that affects absolutely everyone, and everyone can get involved. Secondly, if we don't fix this, nothing else is going to matter. Thirdly, it has what I call stealth properties, the way the spinning wheel or Charka did for Gandhi. Because if you really want to fix climate imbalance, you would have to fix the whole culture that has led up to it. And that's exactly what I want. And finally, it's entirely up to us because it's been abundantly proven by now that governments and corporations are paralyzed, uh, if not actually obstructive. So what I then propose concretely that we look on for the next 10 years is to get a handle on climate disruption and turn it around that we do it nonviolently using all the features mentioned above, and that we come out of this with a network of people who are trained intelligently uh, aware of what nonviolence is and ready to move on to the next challenge. We were at a couple of disadvantages compared to Gandhi's campaign. Uh, he had these communities called ashrams where <clears throat> he had maybe 70, 100 people following intense disciplines uh, to train themselves for satyagraha, make themselves into satyagrahis. Mm, we don't really have a network of communities like that. He also had a strategic vision of when to use constructive and when to use obstructive means, for example, when to launch the salt satyagraha, etc. And he was able to do it, you know, and he said, okay, salt satyagraha starts tomorrow. It started tomorrow. What we can do instead I think is be our own trainers, uh, and I'll say more on that in a moment. <clears throat> that we try to foster new forms of organization that we're learning about, more or less self-organizing, that come more from below, and that's one of the reasons, as you remember, why I think climate disruption is an ideal problem for us to work on. That we learn something about when to use constructive program, make it the basis of our activities, but to be ready when called upon for civil disobedience. Now, this point of be your own trainer, <clears throat> I've worked up five practices that I find useful myself, and I think each one of us can make him or herself <clears throat> more effective in uh, being ready for nonviolence. And let me go back a second here. When I'm talking about the next 10 years, there's another way to think about that that uh, I've learned from Betty Reardon, and that is to think futuristically but act in the moment, act daily. They act daily, act, be present, but be always aware of what your actions are going to result in in the near and not so near future. Okay, so here's five things that I found useful that helps a person get ready for playing her or his role as best as he or she can in the struggles to come. The first is to avoid commercial mass media. I, I know that most of us who are listening in today are not avid television watchers, but if you live in an industrial country, you're exposed to somewhere between three and 6,000 commercial messages a day. Every one of them has an underlying image of a human being that you're separate, uh, finite fragment doomed to competition, can only be satisfied in the external world, 
and that is a, what we're calling a, a toxic culture. Even if you do that, if you avoid commercial mass media, it's useful to adopt a spiritual practice like meditation because a lot of the damage has been done already. And besides, there's an enormous power inside of us that needs to be brought into play, and only through spiritual cultivation can that be made to work. Having done these two things, you'll be in an ideal position to cultivate close personal relationships. I'm thinking here of something that Martin Luther King said, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented civilization to a person-oriented civilization. We want to get involved in decentralized <clears throat> networks that are carrying out various forms of constructive program around basic needs, and especially food is an excellent way to do that. And finally, hope you won't think this is just a personal plug. Sorry, <clears throat> it will be in a second. Uh, to learn everything that you can about nonviolence. And I want to emphasize that if you do this, you're they're substituting for that. If you get the commercial image out of your mind, if you get that culture under control, you can then replace it with a far more vigorous, beautiful culture, uh, which can be derived from nonviolence in the full sense of the word. That's why I started off defining nonviolence the way I did. <clears throat> I'm coming close to the end now. I just wanted to share with you that Meta Center has a number of resources available for point number five, ranging from our wallet card uh, with some nonviolent principles and nonviolent strategies, which has been trans is being translated as we speak into Japanese, Korean, Hebrew, Arabic, Hindi, and I think we're eventually going to be able to make it available in almost other, almost any language. Uh, the book that Jake was kind enough to mention, Search for Nonviolent Future, is available, the pamphlet, so you have resources of different sizes, and I just really recommend the webcast of my year-long nonviolence course at Berkeley, and we're working now to make that more accessible also. And uh, finally, uh, if not a word, an image from our sponsor, and with that, I will draw this presentation to a close. I, I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. And I, I know I was trying to pack in a lot into these 40 minutes, but now I will be very happy to entertain your questions and comments. OK, great. Thank you so much, Michael, for uh, a very insightful presentation. Um, right now, we're going to switch to the question answer session. And once again, if you have a question for Michael that you'd like to ask, you can click on the raise hand button on your control panel. And I will go to the first person, uh, which is Jerry Green. So Jerry, I'm going to unmute you, and you can go ahead and ask your question for Michael. Um, Michael, I'm wondering if you can speak about the idea of engaging with an oppositional force from a grounded and centered place and blending, that is, seeing from the viewpoint of the attacker, it's a principle of Aikido, which is referred to as a martial art of peace. Uh, thank you for that question, Jerry. I actually practiced Aikido for quite a while, and I have a almost permanently sprained uh, knee ligament to prove it. Uh, but seriously, when I was talking about the balance uh, between constructive program and obstructive program, that's precisely what you're doing. You are doing good constructive needed work and at some point the opposition is going to say I don't like that work and it's going to try and take it away from us. So then you engage with that opposition from a position of strength and you have uh, called the shots, you know, you, you are in charge. So I have, like, instead of waiting for some atrocity to happen and then coming back reeling from that atrocity <clears throat> what you do is you do something creative and constructive with yourself if necessary, but you know in community with others ideally, and uh, then you wait for the opposition to to see to understand that this is going to overcome what it's trying to do, and then you come at them with a position of strength. The other thing that you mentioned is critical, and thank you because I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier. One of the triggers, if you will, we don't need to find a different image for that. One of the triggers that engages your nonviolent potential is when you cease to look upon the opponent as 
the opponent in any kind of label and regard her or him as a human being. When you can do that, you're coming from a grounded place and you can behave nonviolently toward that person. What you're actually doing in the mirror neuron model is you're rehumanizing that person. When you see when they offer violence to you, they are offering you indignity. And remember what Gandhi said, I cannot understand why any person thinks that by humiliating another he is adding to his or her own dignity. So that person has actually lowered himself or herself in offering you that violence. When you refuse to accept the violence, which is in the form of seeing that person as a label, as an opponent, as a non-human, you are engaging a whole different attitude and that person is picking that up even neurologically. So thanks, that was a bit of a longer answer than you maybe wanted, Jerry, but I hope that's helpful. Okay, great. Uh, the next person we have uh, waiting is Ned Lazarus. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Ned, and you can ask your question. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Then this computer works. I'm glad it's a new one. <laughs> uh, Michael, thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation. I wanted to ask about Sri Lanka. You brought up uh, the presence of a nonviolent peace army in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And I wanted to ask that both out of interest in the situation in Sri Lanka itself, but also because uh, it appears to me an example uh, that, has, that is very important, what's just happened in Sri Lanka with the government uh, defeating uh, the, the oh, no LTTE uprising through a military campaign. Uh, I'd say that... To, to my understanding, there's a, a, a positive uh, out of that in the sense that the, you know, for oppressed peoples, this uh, this very violent uprising was ultimately unsuccessful, and and uh, in that sense could be an example that uh, could strengthen the case for nonviolence. Uh, but on the other side, in terms of how states uh, deal with uprisings. Uh, it appears to be a very uh, negative or worrisome case in which states yeah. could could say that viol you know violence was ultimately more successful than negotiation and engagement. Yeah, you're right, Ned, and I I hate that example. I <clears throat> I hated it in Kosovo when there were the city of Trenica was being besieged and women from all of, from all over <coughs> Albanian Kosovars each woman baked a loaf of bread and carried it to the gates of the city. They were confronted by Serb policemen and in a little while they turned around and went back. <clears throat> My thought was they should not have gone in the first place unless they were prepared to stay, uh, stay there no matter what. I realize it's very harsh advice, but every time you use a little bit of nonviolence and it doesn't quote work, unquote, it gives the impression that nonviolence has more power despite the statistics that uh, Maria Stefan and others have shown us. But what, that's why in my book I have a whole chapter called Work versus Quote Work, which gives us, I think, a better model to evaluate whether a nonviolent campaign has succeeded or not. And my ultimate conclusion there is to the degree that it is nonviolence, it will always go do good work and put good energy into the system. But whether it's in the immediate term successful or not depends on external uh, criteria. So it's really, really tragic. This is why we have point number five in my little model. They will learn about nonviolence because people see episodes like this and they draw the wrong conclusions because they don't know how to use the right analytical tools. Uh, I think it's very clear that the nonviolent movement indigenously in Sri Lanka had kind of just plain wasn't strong enough for the enormity of the violence that had been going on for so long. And as far as the nonviolent peace force and before them Peace Brigades International, the unarmed civilian peacekeepers, please realize how few of them there were. I mean, at, at its maximum strength, uh, NP Sri Lanka, I think, was 34 people on the ground and about 15 or 20 uh, ready to move in. So 
that they accomplish anything at all, and they do have some marvelous small-scale successes, shows us that more of the same would give us more of the same. I think that's the way to read that history. Thank you, Michael. Um, our next Thank question you. comes from someone, someone who wrote in their question, um, and this person is Laura Castelli, and she asks, although we may, we may know more about nonviolence, how much of the knowledge is actually being practiced and executed if effectively? Um, that's a very good question, Laura. I, I'm not sure I have a number to give you there. In fact, I'm sure I do not. But I have a, a feeling that qualitatively the answer would be very little. Uh, we don't actually, depending on what you mean by we, the world at large still does not know a whole lot about nonviolence. The media are just about 100% clueless about what it is, it's something that we've been working on hard here at the Meta Center. But you're absolutely right that even having head knowledge about how nonviolence works is not going to enable you to be nonviolent in practice. I remember Thich Nhat Hanh saying that uh, you may believe in nonviolence, you may talk about it all the time, but when you're actually confronted with an attacker, unless you have some meditation practice behind you, that belief in nonviolence is not going to engage. So those are, we have to, uh, big improvement in both areas. We need more knowledge and more personal transformation so that we can put that wonderful knowledge into practice. Okay, this next question is also an online write-in question. And it's from John Rudy, and it asks a question about normalizing nonviolence. He asks, is it true that most human interactions are not violent, thus nonviolence is the norm in human relationships, yet violence is seen as the norm? Is part of the way forward to set expectations and change thinking what violent responses are abnormal? Uh, thank you, Rudy. A part of, the, part of the equation definitely is to exactly that, to do an inside-out switch. And what seems normal today has got to seem aberrant when we get on the other side of the looking glass and vice versa. So that you know, the normal reaction of violence has to be shunned and seen as an exception, which in a very real sense it is. As for the first part of your question, that most human interactions are not violent doesn't mean that they're nonviolent in the full sense of the word. You know, they would just be being non-violent. But obviously, we human beings uh, have both elements within us, you know, both love and aversion, both um, competition and cooperation, both violence and nonviolence. And it's obvious also that by training and cultivation, and I was emphasizing today personal cultivation, we can bring out the violent part of us. And I, the, I'm sorry, we can hold down the violent part of us and bring out that nonviolent potential. And that, I guess, is the sum and substance of what I was trying to share with you today. Okay, we have uh, time for a couple more questions. I'm going to go with someone who's had their raised hand. Their hand raised. Um, Bill leaked. Um, I'm going to unmute you, so go ahead and ask your question. Anybody on there? You hear that you also... Uh, Bill, we can hardly hear you here. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay, I've just moved the mic. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. One of the things I've experienced over a long period of time is that uh, there's a lot of resistance to the embodied idea of nonviolence with no, no hyphenation. Uh, any idea how we get through that? I found it both in the peace movement and in the environmental movement. Uh, Bill, could you be a little bit more specific about how that resistance is manifested? Because I, I know we want to think about various jujitsu Aikido methods. <laughs> <laughs> I was rather thinking about uh, Alternatives to Violence Project, uh, yeah. which has had a component of a very, very small component of physicality as part of it, and does talk a lot about embodying. And I think the same thing is true in the uh, of and these uh, nonviolent uh, communication, in right. which there are practitioners who have an idea about embodying it, but who find there's a lot of resistance 
within both of those, and I found similar things within environmental movements, to the idea of embodiment as being uh, a physical pro uh, process, as well as a, an integrative and spiritual emotional process. Yeah. Uh, my, my friends are frantically scribbling notes on both sides of me here. Uh, Vandana Shiva has an excellent quote uh, where she says, if we get rid of the pollution in our minds, that will get rid of the pollution in the environment. Uh, I'm a firm believer that either violence or nonviolence starts in the mind and that we need to work on it there. And yeah, ultimately, um, the mirror neuron uh, studies are helpful here. But uh, sometimes people carry this embodied. Here, what my real objection to the embodiment folks is that they often end up telling you that there is no mind, that it, it's just all in the body, and that is anathema to me. I, I just absolutely cannot bring myself to believe that. So, I think one finds resistance actually, Bill, on all levels. One finds resistance to it as an idea, emotionally. People will resist it, and in terms of bringing it out into physical behavior and using the body to express it, they'll resist it there too. So I'm always remembering Gandhi's wonderful formula. Whenever you have a really innovative, useful idea, it's going to go through four stages. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. All right, uh, we'll skip again to Randy Keller. Hey, Randy. Hey, hello, hello Randy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, brother. How are you? I'm fine. I enjoyed your talk very much, Michael. Thanks so much. Thanks. You're so my, welcome. My question is, you know, um, the, the history of nonviolent action in the world, as you've laid it out, um, is indeed very impressive. And uh, very few people, not enough people, are aware of it. Um, but it mostly, again, as you know, has to do with uh, liberation from uh, political or military tyranny. And what I'm most interested in seeing um, is how nonviolence, active nonviolence, can be applied to um, profound economic and social change that liberates people from the kind of disempowerment, disenfranchisement, and impoverishment that afflicts uh, most of the world's populations. Can you cite any inspiring examples along those lines? Uh, well, Randy, that's exactly why I recommended that we adopt this uh, constructive program approach and make that kind of our ground, our core, and watch for the need for obstructive civil disobedience things to come along. Uh, the most inspiring single example that I know of is um, using integrative power to restore political and economic and, and social culture is that landless peasants movement. In Brazil, it's one of the largest social movements in the world, probably more than 50,000 families have been resettled on recovered land that was owned by these absentee landlords. And they built whole civilization there, you know, uh, their own schools, their own a way of growing and distributing food. Um, unfortunately, they didn't know much about nonviolent defense. So that's where I was recommending that those things get, everybody has to know both wings of the animal. But there's also a large set of examples throughout India where people have recovered land from corporate interests, for example. And uh, they went necessary. They've gone against Coca-Cola, and they've succeeded. They've gone against their own government and held it back. They've gone against networks of rapacious landowners in Tamil Nadu and gotten them to come forward with deeds to their land and voluntarily give over their ancestral properties to uh, Harijan, to you know, formerly non-caste people. So the real tragedy here, Randy, is that we don't hear enough about these things because, you know, when it bleeds, it leads. Our mind is drawn to the duking it out conflict between 
let's say, you know, ideally a brown people being held down by a white people. And we don't, this is why I often recommend that people subscribe to Yes Magazine and just be following these things all the time because it'll build up a whole different idea. All right, so our last question comes from Abraham, who was having microphone trouble um, before. And he says he is from Eritrea, but living in Europe. And his question is, how is it possible to organize nonviolence in countries in Africa where the government is a military dictator like Eritrea, Sudan, Libya, and other authoritative powers where there is no right to speak against the regime? Uh, Abraham, this is a very difficult question, and you're not alone there. We have the same difficulty in the Gaza Strip and uh, occupied territories in the West Bank where uh, the normal w modes of association are forbidden by an extremely repressive regime. And all, all that I can say is I, I cannot admit defeat. Uh, there has got to be a way to do it. Uh, one has to be cautious and one has to use that stealth approach that I was mentioning before that uh, as the people at ICNC are always pointing out, you, your first move should not be to call a huge march and uh, you know walk down the main street of a town, uh, but rather to wait until you have enough strength and legitimacy to do that. To go into this in greater detail, I'd have to actually be sitting there with you and looking at the situation on the ground. Um, but we would be happy to work with you actually at the Meta Center if you wanted to email us and uh, we have worked with people in Togo and we have a person in Benin and uh, <clears throat> we would really be happy to look into this with you. I just want to leave you with the idea that nonviolence will be much harder in those situations but there is also another way of looking at this that the more repressive the regime is, the more vulnerable it is. You can back them into what is called the paradox of repression where in order to you you're doing something perfectly legitimate in order to stop you they have to be extremely oppressive and violent and when they do that um, they look bad and they lose legitimacy and the people stop obeying them so we let's look into that paradox of repression and I think also a great deal can be learned from feminism and uh, liberation theology uh, on that side because they have been in that situation, women have been in that situation from times immemorial. So Abraham, don't give up hope and as far as specifics are concerned, get in touch with us, get in touch with our friends at ICNC and let's see what we can come up with. Okay, thank you Michael. Um, I see at this point we still have a lot of questions. Um, unfortunately we are out of time so uh, we won't be able to call on everyone who has a question. But if you do have a further question for Michael, you can feel free to email um, webinar at nonviolent-conflict.org, and uh, we'll be sure to forward that to him. And um, as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to our website in the next day or two. So feel free to check out our website at nonviolent-conflict.org. Uh, once it is posted, and then you can go back and listen to anything you missed. So at this time, I'd like to ask you, Michael, if you have any final remarks to make. Uh, Jake, I've uh, so much appreciated your making this available. I <clears throat> wish I could get to know better the people who are out there in webinar land, but this has been uh, very encouraging and inspiring for us, helped us pull our ideas together, and uh, let's all go forward together for, toward a nonviolent future.